They moved to Hollywood to make it big. They hit the beach and started having kids. Read it all over in Sunday papers again. It'll be a little echoey. That's fine. We're going to explain it. We'll explain it. Are you going to headphones, bitch? Got him. Got him. I mean, are you starting the show? I'm clap. ready. You, I'm ready. You, want you, you want me to clap? Three, yeah, want three, me. Two, two, one. one. Three, two, one. Read all about it. Read all about it. Mike Gibbons is somewhere in New York State piping in the news. I'm in Venice Beach coming to you live on Sunday Papers. It is. It is echoey in here. I will give you that. Yeah. I'm going to open this window. Oh, that window. That window doesn't open. Um, right. Where are you? I'm in a cabin, basically, uh, up in you know Carmel, New York, uh, on the lake here. It's amazing with the girls. July Fourth, happy July Fourth week. Happy Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Today's the third of July. We're very excited about our country, and you know, okay. this. Okay. The, well, you know what? Here's the okay, thing. Okay, what? Oh, tell me. Here's the thing. Break it down. We are privileged to live in a country where a lot of things are not going our way right now and we yeah. have recourse and that we can vote new people in, we can demonstrate, we can write about it, we can talk about it, and you can't take that for granted. Things, things go back and forth and we can't give up right now just because there's a lot of legislation going through that we don't agree with. Sounds like a pep talk for yourself. You okay? You going through some stuff? Mikey Fitzgibbons just gave me that talk on the golf course. I love that. Yeah, yeah, he's really, is he still convinced they're all going to jail? I mean, that's the thing about these hearings is nothing, nothing will happen because of them. Oh, come on. Really? You think so? Oh, my God. I mean, they're not even covered. No, I don't on. know. I don't know. Well, let's not get political. Let's talk about how red you are. Have you been out in the sun? I've been in the sun, but I'm also, I just got out of the shower real fast and the shirt's not doing me favors, nor is this lighting. Yeah, but it doesn't, this is also a podcast, isn't it? Last I checked. Well, some to, people like to look at us. I don't understand those people at all. But um, of course I went on a rant last year at this time, but uh, Gettysburg continues. It's the anniversary of Gettysburg. The fighting began today. It was only a three-day fight. And uh, and the older I get, the more blown away. And I was blown away the first time I heard the stats. But the more blown away I am as I get older. I mean, 100,000 people died? I think it was 76 or something. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me confirm. Military uh, Gettysburg stats. Yeah. Like... Changed the tide of the war, that battle. It, it absolutely did. It absolutely did. But, um, yeah, no, no, sorry. 51,000. It was – and some of the fighting, and, I'm, and I apologize for listeners who actually listened a year ago. Some of the fighting – where did you go? Where's the Zoom? Um, didn't begin till the evening. I think on two of the three days, fighting didn't begin actually till like, late afternoon. Right. And over 50,000 Americans killed in a three-day weekend. Keep in mind what kind of arms they were using also. It's yeah. just insane. It's insane. And it was. Uh, and there were people on a hill. I guess they uh, came. I think Lincoln might have been on the hill. And they were watching the battle take place like they were watching Coachella. It was just happening in front of them. Probably a little different vibe. Um, yeah. And. And I can already hear the corrections, but Lincoln, Lincoln, no, not Lincoln, not there at all. But Grant, and I think it was, uh, I forget whose charge, God, I'm just because I'm ignorant. But at one point I knew a lot more stats about Gettysburg, but it was it one was of the It was Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee led the charge for the South. I know that because they broke through a few other Southern states to get there. They drove No, up. no, no, of course. Lee was there, but, you know, Lee sent in on the first on Friday, I think it was Friday, on Friday afternoon or whatever, one of his guys was, one of his, I don't know if it's a general, I shouldn't say that, but one of his leaders was like, or lieutenants was like, uh, we don't got this. Like, I can tell you right now, this will not go well. And Lee goes, 
you're going in anyway. And it was a massacre. And if they had gotten through, they were headed to Washington next. Game over. Fucking queen in danger. Topple right. the king. Yeah, it was over. So, Tickets charge, I think, might have been it. And yeah, little round top battle, I believe. Yeah. Pickett's charge. Oh, man, that was awful. But, um, but what I like to remember, speaking of America, you know, everyone would always do that thing like, you know, kind of the joke about losing Vietnam, like we're six and one or whatever it is yeah. about wars. Uh, what I like to add is we're seven and one because America also defeated these the fucking South. I, I just want to remind everybody That's that. True. that has to go in the win column for America. Right. It's true. And if you're yeah. in the South, um, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> I think they might have just left, actually, the podcast. Yeah. Well, now, I think, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, Tex and Texas wants to leave the uh, union again. That's a big thing. Yeah, they're really, I am not printing up the placards to go marching for that one. If I am, it's like, what took you so long? Yeah. Good luck with the forward-thinking fossil fuel model. I'm sure it'll all work out. Can uh, I, the water might be a situation also. Um, what was this text you sent? To, we were on a text chain with our college buddies about an hour ago, and you wrote something about, I'm getting ready for podcasts, which Greg won't even acknowledge doing in 15 minutes. What does that mean? It means that on the, okay, Sunday, on our Sunday papers, uh, text chain. Uh, no, I this, wrote, so you wrote that on, oh, okay, go I ahead. know what, I, uh, 107 today. Are we doing five Eastern, meaning in four hours? I need to be done a little after six. Denman, our producer, our fantastic producer. Uh, just let me know. Oh, there you wrote yes. No, wait, sorry. Yeah, I wrote yes, yes. Sorry, no, no, your yes was at 4.30. Yeah, because I was on the golf course. I don't pick up my phone when I'm on the golf course. Oh, man. Uh, we man. had it confirmed, five o'clock. What, what, what are you, suddenly a secretary? You got to reconfirm things? What are you, the executive assistant to Mike Gibbons? I like to be unprepared, and that takes a while. That's I right. To, it's a lot to do. Yeah. Can I tell you? I just want to go through my week at the comedy store. So I was there about five nights ago and uh, on stage in the main room, and this woman just stands up. Like, I wasn't even talking to her. She just stand up and yelled something in response to one of my jokes. And I said, all right, what's going on, lady? What are you, what are you doing? She goes, I'm drunk and I want some attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most honest heckler I've ever heard yes, in my life. Yes, I loved it. And so I loved her honesty. So I wasn't, I wasn't attacking her. I was trying to draw her out, figure out what was going on. And, uh, and, we, and, the, and the, the security at the store is unbelievable. So there's suddenly there's two big dudes with headsets on standing about seven feet behind her. And she's just, we're going back and forth. I'm handling it like a pro, being gentle. And then she said something. I go, Jesus Christ, you'd think, you think somebody at your age would be able to drink, would know, would know how much to drink. And she fucking charged the stage. So they no. tackle her. They tackle her from behind. And the crowd's going fucking bananas. And they drag her out. And her husband, her husband, who's Asian, and she was saying, he can't even see you because of his slanty eyes. She was saying that about her husband in front of the crowd. That's and, love. And so then he goes, you're fucking drunk again. And he walks out <laughs> and apparently walked out to the front of the comedy store and just kept walking down Sunset. So they drag her outside. She's kicking. She's screaming. She's, she's hysterical. They put her, they stick her on the curb in front of the club. <laughs> and she stood there and yelled shit at the club for like 20 minutes. That's amazing. So that was like five nights ago. And then two nights ago, I'm in the original room. And the air conditioning conks out, which it does there sometimes because the building's yeah. like 100 years old. And uh, and so the room is about 110 degrees. Not exaggerated. It was like 110 degrees. And I'm on stage. I took my shirt off. And Whoa, Chrysler. Whoa. No, no. I had an undershirt on, but I took off oh, my button-down shirt. Oh, God for everyone there. And uh, I'm halfway through my set, and then somebody yells out, Call 911! Is there a doctor in here? This guy fucking fell out of his chair. Big dude. And he's fucking out. And his wife is hysterical. She's like, she's like, oh my God, somebody help him! And of course, like, typical I'm mob killed. mentality, everybody gets up and they crowd around him. 
Like literally, I'm literally on stage going, everybody go back to your seats. Somebody call 911. Do we have a doctor in here? Go back to your seats. And so um, luckily one of the security guys is a paramedic. So he comes really? over. Yeah. So he comes over and uh, gets the guy. I think he gave him a Heimlich maneuver or something. And uh, But he wasn't choking. And, and oh. I don't know. And then, and then, like, and he, they, and he might be a paramedic, <laughs> and para, paraplegic. No, he's a paraplegic. Yeah. And uh, and then I think they got some cold towels and stuff. And I think he just had a heat stroke because they they picked him up and they carried him out. And uh, wow, like, dude. yeah, it was crazy. And I just finished my set and I was like, "All right, folks, here's Moshe Kasher. Thanks for coming. Good luck, Moshe. Yeah. Well, I'm having heat stroke here, so. It's hot in New York. I mean, not that hot, but in the 90s and humid as hell. And I love when my daughters are like, what? I'm like, yeah, that's humidity. And then get ready for the mosquitoes, you L.A. snowflakes. Yeah. So anyway, but so I was going to tell this story because it happened during the pandemic, but it happened right here. So I'm at Tim and Jenny's house and you know them and it's amazing. And they're so excited when we all come in. There's 35 people coming over in like an hour and it's going to be this big party and Tim's running around and he has like seven coolers all over the place and, and, and is constantly during the day cycling to make sure there's enough ice on all of them. He's got white claws for these dumb bitches and all this stuff and, and real wine and real beer and real drinks also. And anyway, it's great. So that's where I am during the pandemic. They all came up from New York. Hold on. My mic is hot. Cause I'm talking into it. So, during the pandemic, they were all up here. We were in L.A., but and the next door, you know the DeBourbons, right? Yeah. Michelle, Mishi, Mishi, right? So her sister, Lisi, I know it sounds made up. Lisi, they all, for their mental well-being, and I'll move this story along, and I know I'm going to massacre it, but this absolutely happened. They got a Peloton, kind of like as a community. And everyone had their schedule of when they would use it. And they put it on the on the porch off of this cabin, right outside this window. It was outside. And um, so anyway, one day, it's Lisey's uh, turn or whatever. And it's during a work day. And Tim is on a Zoom, a work Zoom, in the house, which is across the driveway. Lisey's on it. She's really going for it. And I don't know how else to say this. She wipes out. And it's like an explosion. She falls over. It smashes. There's glass everywhere. It's like the TV her, commercial. Her, it is exactly like the TV commercial, but it happened before the TV commercial. So when the commercial came on, everyone was like, oh, my God, did you see the commercial? That's Holy Lisey. shit. That's hilarious. That's Lisey. Glass everywhere. Her foot flew out of one of the shoes. Um, and then the... It flew out of one of the shoes and unclipped from the other. And so while the bike was on its side, the pedal was flying around with an empty shoe in it. Just just <laughs> flying around like crazy. Her <laughs> other leg was pinned under the bike. Tim's on a Zoom and he literally, and he's, he works anyway for a big company. And he goes, um, guys, excuse me. I think the roof just caved in on my guest house. I'll be right back. <laughs> Runs over here, sees Lisi around shattered glass with a Peloton spinning out of control. <laughs> Picks her up and is like, I gotta go back to the Zoom. Goes back to the Zoom and they're like, Oh my God, is it all right? What what, what was it? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, my roof fell in. It's it's fine. Like what? <laughs> how? What is he gonna say? Is he gonna explain that? So, so Lisi feels so bad because it's literally keeping everybody's mental health. So anyway, here's the end of the story. She calls customer service immediately. And is like, Listen, I need to talk to you. Uh, we need this Peloton and I tipped over on it, crashed. It, I think there's a flaw in the design. I don't know if the weight's too far forward or whatever. They're like, ma'am, what? And he's like, no, no, no. I'm sure you get these calls all the time. I need a new monitor sent right away. They're like, ma'am, we've never even heard of this. We've never heard this complaint. She's like, no, you must have. I, you don't understand. We need it. I need your manager. I need your manager. She Karen's out. She goes up three levels of managers and goes to like the national corporate person and the person goes, okay, I've been briefed a little bit on what happened to you. Say it again. And she's and she tells the story. And she goes, and the only question is a long pause. And the woman goes, were you on a boat? And Lisa's like, what? And the woman's like, because the only other time this has ever happened, some billionaire was pelotoning on his yacht. And the yacht hit a wave and it fell over and crashed. And anyway, 
she goes, you need to get me this monitor. Like, right, she's like, well, it's a two week delivery and all this. And she's like, felt so bad. She went back and told them the next day, I think FedEx felt, I mean, I think the Peloton felt so sorry for her. They like hyper FedEx it. It arrived the next morning, a brand new monitor on the house from Peloton. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is another segment from the wide world of white from Mike Gibbons. You got Mishi it. Mishi and Lisi DeBourbon were on their Peloton when the guest house roof fell in on the hey, lake that's, house. That's the story we're going with. <laughs> All right. You read your dates. I have to turn on the AC. I'm now baking. It's 90 degrees in here. And that story didn't help. <laughs> Oh, my God. We got to do that as a regular. I mean, it's not even a bit. It's just Mike Gibbons talking about his life. He's in, you know, uh, well, we'll we're, we're going to talk more about this trip that he's on because, bel believe it or not, it gets whiter. Um, let's thank uh, Kyle Spencer for this week's logo. Um, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an abortion logo, which is a very funny one. Anytime we can get abortion and funny together, we appreciate it. Also, Mitchie Mitch did this week's song. Last week's song by uh, Les Conley, he did kind of a Frampton vibe, and people loved it. it we, we got so much great feedback about that last song. So that, that goes in the short list for uh, the permanent song, which, by the way, we got a, a note from Andy who said, uh, I have to bring up a small beef with you boys. It's been 120 episodes, and you still don't have an official song? Greg teased months ago that you were deciding on a winner. Are you two turning super new age hippie and want to give the opportunity for the show to decide when he, she, they are an adult podcast? I apologize if I don't know the pronouns of the podcast. Sincerely, Andy. Um, yeah, it's time. It's time to lock one down, Mike. Time to lock down a song. All right. Well, we have a lot to choose from, and I think a yeah. lot of them are safe to air, right? Yes. They say we're only picking ones that Check. do not sound like uh, anybody else. Check. Um, right. I, at one right. point, I had it narrowed down to 10 songs, but that was a while ago, and we've had a bunch since. So I'll have to go in and pull out some more, and then we'll, we'll decide. Is this not working, the continuing to do it like this? Uh, well, I mean, we could. It's just that... We get we get flagged sometimes when somebody copyrights their song. No, I know, but how often is that happening now that like our uh, our musicians know that? Well, hopefully they know it, but it's uh, it's happened with two different people. Uh. So anyway, and one of them it ghosts us now, and I really went out of my way to not throw him under the bus. I never really? mentioned him by name. What? You go, this is why I don't read viewer mail. If they're going to ghost us, I can't take that. I'm too right. sensitive. Uh, speaking of emails from listeners, we got some corrections. Joe Burke says, mm. uh, first tracks from first albums. When MC Rook suggested fake tales of San Francisco by the Arctic Monkeys, Mike said he only knew Chasing Cars, which is actually a song by Snow Patrol. Ah, Very different right. than uh, Arctic Monkeys. Arctic Monkeys have a good one, though. There's, it's a ballad -y type, I'm forgetting, but absolutely right. When I said it, I wasn't so sure. Good call. Good catch. I can't stand the Arctic Monkeys. What, what, how, do you, how do they bother you so much? They're just too... They're too packaged and... Um, do you I don't know, know that, or you just don't like their name? No, I don't, I don't like the music. It's, it just doesn't move me. It just, it's just blah. Ah. Okay. Um, you know who I, I like is Arcade Fire. Okay. They're a better version of Arctic Monkeys. That's a big band. Yeah. Christian they, uh, said, I put a spell on you is a screaming Jay Hawkins tune from 1956, not Creedence Clearwater Revival, which is there's certain bands that are uh, doppelgangers sound wise. You have Supertramp and um, uh, who's Dying the band that sounds one. like Supertramp? Not yes. You're not thinking of them, are you? No. Uh, Super uh, Tramp and um, Don't say Rush. No. All right. And but then you've I got. Yes, it is. You're right, and I forgot to. And I know Screaming Jay Hawkins' song. It's great. Yeah. It, they play it. It gets a lot of airplay at Halloween. So if anybody wants to send in the doppelganger 
bands that can be a category also so, but is your premise that screaming jay hawkins and ccr are doppelgangers oh fuck yeah i mean you listen to i put a spell on you and you could easily hear that that's uh that's uh what's his name uh, john fogarty singing it i i don't know man you may want to go back and check screaming jay hawkins goes to town with theatrics on that song also like stuck in lodi who'll stop the rain you know uh, i don't know that's ccr the, yeah yeah but you're say they sound like screaming jay hawkins yeah <laughs> okay we're gonna agree to disagree on this one tori strasberg i think you're mixing up plan b and the abortion pill the former doesn't abort a fetus it prevents a pregnancy the latter does the abortion up to 10 weeks with only the last two being at the fetal stage since the embryonic stage lasts eight weeks. Maybe being pe pedantic, but quite a distinction. Well, there's a very big difference in one case for sure. You don't want to be taking plan B. I don't even know. I've already forgotten which one is which, but you don't want to be taking the one that prevents the drop, you know, two weeks in. Wait, so one of them you take the day after or w within a couple days. Plan B is the morning after pill. And then I guess there's another pill that uh, kills the fetus. Good Lord, are we using that inflammatory language? I would. One is like, holy shit, the condom broke. Yeah. What do we do? Right. And, you know, and that's, that that's, one, that's, and that one tells your system that it is not pregnant. Right. That one prevents the egg from dropping. Yeah. Where all the ambitious stir sperm are waiting. Denman is and typing. still coming. Denman is typing furiously. He seems to have quite a bit of experience with aborting he fetuses. He says they're both abortion no matter how you slice it. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? How? What, what do minorities mom, have to do with this? Denman? His mom took a roll down the staircase, week thirty-four. What is he? Thirty-four. Type? And his brother still came out, but he's a little special now. Uh, Mark Fry said it is. It is not very dangerous to take the abortion pill. Doctor supervision is a formality and a cash grab. Okay. Uh, tell right, Mike Mark the Tuskegee. Fry. Tell Mike the Tuskegee experiment regarding purposefully infecting unknowing patients with syphilis is not related to the Tuskegee Airmen that was labeled a Tuskegee military experiment. There are numerous articles and podcasts if you Google what takes place in both, but the thing they had in common were both were taking place in a small town in Alabama, Tuskegee. Good to know. Yeah. Good to, I was definitely conflating those two. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they happen around the same time. Somebody else wrote in and they both happened in like the 40s and 50s. All right. Well, obviously, World War II was the Tuskegee Airmen, and that then, and I believe the Tuskegee um, syphilis experiment thing was started in like the 30s, and it went all the way through until like the 1970s or something. It's crazy. Another unrelated, Greg, you mixed up Billy Idol and Billy Squire, but you were not wrong that Billy Idol also has a masturbation song, "Dancing with Myself." Never all thought right. of that. Also, Blister in the Sun by Violent Femmes, who you brought up coincidentally this week, is, a, is another masturbation song. There's a lot of them out there. Wow. Uh, ads. Let's read an ad, Mike. I love it. You want me to do it or you want to do it? Why don't you I do think it? you. I'm a little hot still. This AC hasn't started working. Oh, Jesus. Don't pass out on me. That already happened this week. I know. Well, I'm, I'm hydrating with a beer now, which I never do. Hey, now. I used to dread taking the time and effort to fertilize my lawn, but now I look forward to it. Sunday's lawn care products are quick and easy, and I don't even have to go to the store. Everything is delivered right to my door. Uh, look, beautiful lawns. You don't want harsh chemicals. I got dogs. I don't need my dogs dying that way. I don't care if they die, but I don't want them dying eating fucking poison <laughs> fertilizer. So these guys use, like, seaweed, iron molasses, and it really works. Uh, do you have... Do you have pet spots, bear patches, whatever? They can solve all those problems. They've got what you need. Um, my lawn is looking better than ever, and I did it myself. 
Sunday makes it easy to DIY your lawn with no guesswork and no unwanted chemicals. So make your lawn the oasis it needs to be. Uh, just get Sunday.com. Go to Sunday.com, put in your address, and their lawn analysis tool does the rest. They use soil and climate data to create a personal nutrient plan delivered to your door when you need it. Uh, Sunday's lawn care products are made with the family in mind. That's why they use ingredients you feel good about. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off full season. This seems crazy, but listen to the price. Full season plans start at just $129 and you can get 20% off when you get, get, when you visit get Sunday dot com slash papers at checkout that's 20 percent off your custom plan at get sunday.com slash papers do it you'll feel really good every time you come home and you see that nice lawn oh boy on autopilot there's no reason not to do it yeah uh okay um let's go down to hacked and deleted you want to read that one what are we talking about Second story. Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. Do you mean the front page? Front page. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, this Good has Lord, no Good Lord, how do you read a paper? You just guess? Extra! Extra! Read all about it! Extra! Uh, here we go. Here's my... No, I don't want to do that one. Here's my receipt from the waiting room in Omaha, Nebraska. Didn't do well. Well, you were waiting to do well. It's a horrible name. Hacked and deleted. Anonymous uh, hacks period tracker apps and deletes data to protect abortion seekers after Supreme Court decision. The hacker group Anonymous claims they have hacked and deleted all that data um, uh, to protect the identity of potential abortion seekers. The hacktivists, I think that's their wordplay here, latest uh, claims... Uh, th their latest claims come as American women have begun deleting their period tracking apps amid the Supreme Court's decision to overturn the abortion ruling. Um, so I have, which one do I have? I'll look on my phone right now. Flow, maybe? I Flow, it's right there. I have a, a period app on the phone, and of course everyone is way ahead of me and can guess why. It's because I it started in my failed marriage. I would try to anticipate when I should just agree with whatever she was saying. Get out of here. Really? S swear to God. And then she commented, and this is what an idiot I am. She commented at one point, like they were getting along. And I'm like, well, I've started to agree with you more. And that didn't go well at all. Of course it didn't. Why would you say that? I... I felt she should know that, and I thought maybe she'd do some growing and learning. And that that's not... It, the opposite happened. Oh, my God. You were tracking her periods. That's hysterical. And then it was on my phone, and I kept it for girlfriends as well. And, and uh -huh. now the daughters. And now the daughters were... Because this is what happens a lot of times uh, when talking to anybody, right? But we all know what I mean women but let's say anybody you are like this wait what like you're confounded and you're just like uh, wait what i don't even know what's being linked here i don't know the how this has gotten so off the rails and this app will help me and so i would also put it in my calendar because i'm not going to always open the app but i think you can set alerts where you're just like oh no right right that must be so tough the crazy fucking thing you just said must be so tough wow yeah, and what I'm keeps sorry. you from just what keeps you from being a caring empathetic person the other 28 days of one the week month? a month that's all i got <laughs> one week a month is all i got of that bullshit <laughs> Cue the real men of genius Budweiser song right now. They need reality. They need an, if my job as a dad is anything, it's to teach them there's a reality yeah. that won't give as much a shit about you as you would love. Yeah, that's what they need from a parent. They're not going to get that anywhere else. <laughs> that's exactly right. Look at me day drinking. I don't give a shit. Uh, all right. Um, you want to go down to camping? 
Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, social media has been flooded by posts from people offering to take people, quote, camping, coded language for assisting people needing abortions out of state. But some activists and experts warn that offering to house strangers isn't as helpful as connecting them with local abortion rights organizations. Okay, so on social media, I have seen some people post, if you want to come to town... For dinner, I will make sure your dinner is taken care of. I will take you to dinner. I will be with you. I will stay there. I will drive you home from dinner. You know, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I have to say, the uh, the appeal is way, way more heartwarming when it's a woman saying it than right. a guy who's going to pick up a perfect vulnerable stranger at the airport and take her to quote dinner. Right. It just, and they can stay in his house. I understand it's very benevolent, very nice, but yeah. it, it, it does. It's more comforting coming from a woman. Yeah. You want a woman's touch at that time. Yeah. I don't know um, what I'm talking about, but yeah. Uh, here's another, uh, what's another nice though language. for me is if I offered, uh, one thing I wouldn't need is the Flow app. I wouldn't need a period app. Nope. Be nope. Not at all. I know what I'm getting. Wouldn't yep. even have to look at the calendar. I'm sh everything's going to go just smoothly. Yeah, you can shut down that app for a few months. You got about three <laughs> months off. Oh, no. Oh, we're terrible. All right, uh, go ahead. Wait, we're about to get worse because a group oh. of Texas educators have proposed to the Texas State Board of Education. Are they still a state? That slavery should be taught as, quote, involuntary relocation during second grade social studies instruction. This oh. summer, the board will consider updates to social studies instruction a year after lawmakers passed a law to keep topics that make students, quote, feel discomfort out of Texas classrooms. So involuntary relocation instead of calling it slavery. What about... Unpaid internships. They, 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 there was a lot of unpaid internships in the, in the 19th century <laughs> in the Deep South. There was cotton camp. A lot, a lot of people went to cotton camp. Yeah, it was so hot at cotton camp. Everyone remembers that in the dorms. Oh, my God. This is fucking it, crazy. It wasn't just the re... I'm surprised they're admitting it was involuntary. It wasn't just the relocation, though. I mean, what, what, was, what about the whippings and... and yeah. And, and the, the rape. labor. And right, separating and rape. families. Oh, my God. It's like those HR terms where it's like, uh, I mean, obviously downsizing was the most popular one. But they had really creative phrases like that to describe getting axed. Yeah. Right, right. That's, oh, man, Texas. Good luck with that. Here's a, it, 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 they don't want topics that, here's a topic that might make Texas students feel uncomfortable. Science. Are they are they going to cut science? Because that goes in the yeah. face of everything they believe in. Yeah, they may also learn about the fossil fuel sitch, which would be very yeah. disturbing to right. them. Right, right. Uh, time for good news for Gubbins. You have one. Here it is. All right. So what we're, is this from? So this is from an hour ago. We were playing golf, and we were playing for money. He and I, and. Uh, we're, we're pretty dead even. And then uh, this guy from the fairway behind us starts yelling at me, Hey, you with the blue hat. You with the blue hat. What ball did you just hit? And I had hit a ball that was like went over towards the other fairway where he was playing. And, uh, and he goes, Did you hit a tailor made with, with the green dot on it? So I reach in my pocket and it turns out I had hit his ball. And so I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. And I threw it to him and he, he fucking yelled at me. Anyway, Gubbins charged me a penalty stroke in the match because I I'm hit the him. wrong ball. I'm with him. Really? I don't know. I don't know how golf works. What's a penalty? So like that stroke counted, but you had to do it again. No, I had already finished the hole and I had, oh. gotten, a, I had gotten a four and he made me take a five because I had hit the guy's ball. Oh, all right. But yeah, it's Gubbins. What are you doing? You're betting, man. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not betting with him anymore. Ooh. I'm done. You should have told him that. I think he would have let this one go. Yeah. 
Uh, let's do entertainment. You got it. All right. Ricky Martin hit with a $3 million unpaid commissions lawsuit. His ex-manager claims she saved him from potentially career-ending allegations. The jury-seeking uh, suit adds that, quote, Martin has now threatened Rebecca, who's his manager, and is attempting to force her to sign an agreement with a non-disclosure clause to silence her about the uh, abhorrent behavior by Martin that she has both witnessed and endured, oh. end quote. Um, there's an ass assertions of, in her relationship, managing him, a toxic work environment and, quote, a particularly ugly incident in Dubai involving Martin as a representative, Jose Vega, uh, in a personal life, and his personal life was in disarray, non-payment of taxes, and his substance abuse. So... Uh, basically, and I've read some comments that uh, she, she's essentially blackmailing him. That's what some people's opinions are, because it's a lawsuit where he won't pay commissions. And now they're saying, if you don't pay him, we're going to go public with your dirty laundry. Yeah. And it well, sounds like the guy's tortured. And I have a guess at what it is. I think Ricky Martin is a closeted heterosexual. <laughs> The ball got rolling on him being gay, and it was yeah. too big to get back in the yeah. box. Right, right. Everyone ran with it. He was an international star. Right. I was going to say, if the plan was to out him, I think living La Vida Loca might have uh, might have done that already. That might have been the trick. He, um, I watched a documentary. I started watching a documentary last night about Menudo, which is how he started. He was in. He was a member of Menudo. Did you know? I didn't that, know that. Yes. And did you know that that band, which is really the first boy band of all time, if you don't include like the Monkees or whatever, the they were Beals. older. But yeah. these kids were like, you know, 12 to 15 years old. And uh, they were produced by this fucking genius in Puerto Rico who basically, if a kid left because he got too old or for whatever other reason, yeah. they plugged a new guy in. Ricky Martin wasn't an original member. They They had like... They had like 15 Menudo members over the course of 15 years. It just kept cycling through. I do know that. I do know that they, and they've done that with other bands as well, I think. I'm trying to remember who, but yeah. They did it with the drummers and Def Leppard. <laughs> um, is that the band where they, they all died? Two of them did died they? or I know, one of them Didn't died? one of them have a one arm? Wouldn't they have a one arm drummer? I think there was also that. Mm. Um, you remember a tells joke that he woke up one morning super hungover and he had a tattoo that said I love men so he got it he got it fixed uh, but he doesn't know if I love menudo is any better <laughs> <laughs> if I could write one joke like that every 10 years I would be happy with myself um, oh Gregory he was huge. He is huge. I mean, I don't know. We don't know it because we're not into Latin music, but he is a star of epic proportions around the world that I don't think people in America really appreciate. Oh, dude, nonstop. I'll go on Instagram and some Spanish speaking friend of mine will be at the forum sold out or an act will be there no joke for two or three nights at the forum and i've never heard of them yeah and right. it's all spanish language performers and stuff that uh, was another it was another atel joke from a long time ago he goes uh i want to learn how to speak spanish that way i'll know what i'm laughing at when i watch telemundo <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah uh, um Friends, oh, this is a big story. Uh, Friends has long been criticized for its lack of diversity, but co-creator Marta Kaufman is finally ready to admit her failure with a $4 million apology. Whoa. Uh, she initially struggled to grasp the difficult and frustrating criticisms of her television series, choosing to believe the successful show was being singled out. But two decades after, she's begun to see the error of her ways. Quote, I've learned a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, admitting and accepting guilt is not easy. It's painful looking at yourself in the mirror. I was embarrassed I didn't know better 25 years ago. 
Uh, the popular show, which ran from 94 to 2004, features a group of six white heterosexual best friends living in Greenwich Village, a famously gay neighborhood. Throughout the 10-year run of the show, the sitcom continued to whitewash New York City and rarely featured a character of color. Friends only introduced two recurring characters of color, both of whom were brought on as short-lived love interests for Ross. And when they booked them, when they booked those two black people, uh, the, Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld were like, sellouts. <laughs> I mean, yes, it is known as the whitest show ever. And what's her name? She's a comedian. And she's always like, uh, also known as the black woman on Friends. Uh, Aisha you, Tyler. Yeah, Aisha Tyler. So also, uh, Sherry Shepard was on, who's, who Chris Denman produces her podcast. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, Joey and, was uh, Joey was Italian, and they're not. Not everyone considers them white. Have they no. ever tried that? Have they ever tried that defense? Right. Just watch uh, Natural Born Killers, and uh, it'll be explained to you. I, I think. I don't think it was that movie. It was the one in the desert. Uh, oh, right. You're right. You're right. I always confuse those two movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, Tarantino wrote it and was actually in it, I think. But anyway, um, is Tarantino in every one of his movies? Was he in Once Upon a no. Time? Okay. So anyway, uh, like Hitchcock, not even a I little. I think he used to be, and he got the hint when people said, you are literally the worst actor I've ever seen in my life. Also, we'll think of you whenever we see women's feet. Like, that's kind of like you being in there, like Hitchcock's shadow. Yeah, right. Um, so, uh, but is there a defense like, that's what it was? In other words, okay, this is an exaggerated example that doesn't hold any water, pardon the pun. But, like, how many black people were in Moby Dick? In other words, like... It, She's probably embarrassed that that's, that was her world and her world was being reflected in a show she created. Yeah, but she was in New York City, which is one of the most diverse places in the world. I mean, Moby Dick took place in Massachusetts in the, in the 1800s. Yeah, but six douchebags living in the village, they don't have many diverse friends. Yeah, that's possible. They're not likable people. It was the most first world problem show ever. Wait, are you talking about Seinfeld or, or Friends? Friends. Yeah. It was six douchebags who just constantly made dick jokes. Right. Why would a black person want to hang out with them? I have never lasted more than five minutes watching Friends. It literally, uh, it's not that I even get angry. I just get so bored. Well, I remember Norm MacDonald like, talking to Hoffman and me and just being like, uh, why don't we just start with models and then just write a shitty sitcom? Yeah, exactly. He was like, you know, when he was frustrated on like, yeah, we need money. Yep. And that'll pay uh, for us to say no to anything we want. Have you seen the staircase yet? Well, you know, I famously, I was a huge early adopter and proponent of the, of the documentary, which for a long period was, I might've even done it to you. Uh, was only available on DVD. You couldn't stream it or find it anywhere. It wasn't on HBO. And I remember in the early 2000s or whenever it was, that was like, you know how some people give books to people? I would give them the DVD of The Staircase. I had like 20 of them. Because it, it was made in France, and it, I don't even think it got distribution in the U.S. until, what happened? It came out like 15 years later? French director, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting all the details. What I haven't seen is the three that were added to it, the documentary. But now I am aware, and I've seen maybe episode one. And boy, in episode one, they really, there's one very big reveal about uh, hi him and like and him going to the gym. That's all I'll say. That reveal came very early. And the documentary, the documentary they buried it, yeah. was like 12 episodes or something. I am not even joking you, and I'm sure by design, it would end like one week and you'd be like totally guilty next week. This dude is innocent next week. Right. So guilty. I didn't see right. that. They didn't tell us about that next week. Innocent. It was amazing. Do you believe, well, I think it was the same thing with, um, what was the one about the guys in, uh, Wisconsin? Oh, how to, uh, create, creating a murderer, making, yeah, a, making yeah a murderer. that was the same thing. I went back and forth every week. 
Yeah, where are you now on it? I, again, I didn't see the new one there. Staircase, I believe he fucking killed her. This guy killed her. Really? I mean, if you're on the fence, his other wife also died bludgeoned to death at the bottom of a stairway. Which says to me he's innocent. Or he's a genius. Okay. <laughs> let's say let's say my period app wasn't working, right? And I just fucking killed my wife because just too crazy. Just too yeah. crazy. So I put her out of her misery. Um, and let's say I did it by... Uh, running her head over in the garage with a car. Something, you know, that's easy easy on the ears right now, right? So if I then had another wife who had crazy periods and I wanted to kill her, uh, I would kill her the exact same way. And, and let's say I was innocent. I was proven innocent the first time. I think I would kill her the exact same way. Because, Just because you stick with the game plan. Well, <laughs> it's not only a game plan. Who would be that fucking stupid? Yeah. And... And the world knows I'm a relatively smart guy if I'm this guy because this guy is like a best-selling author. Yeah, right. Like he has a brain. He's successful. Yep. He can think creatively. He can come up with stories. Very much so. Like like doing dudes at the gym. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. He is outside the box, smart, creative. Somebody uh, so suggests we should watch something called Keep sweet pray and obey about the mormons i keep hearing how amazing this doc is so maybe we'll watch that for next week and then i found out that uh under the banner of heaven or whatever it's called which is a scripted series i started watching it you know i, I got episode two i remember i was fading a little but i didn't know it was a john krakauer book and i love john krakauer he wrote into thin air into the wild and yeah he he wrote the book uh, that that series is based on. So I really want to read and or listen to Crack Hour. Um, I tried to watch um, The Flight Attendant. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, too much. Little... They hit you with too much. It's like, you know, it's so high stakes and it's so frenetic and it's so she's drinking too much. It's just like, hey, I just want to watch some fucking TV here. I don't need to get dragged through... Do you know what I mean? A little, yeah, but you like when it grabs you, too. I like when it grabs you, but I have to care enough about the character that I'm going to go for that ride. You can't just show me uh, a, a dire circumstance and, and, and want me to, to pull for this character unless I like them or at least I understand them. Yeah, and I mean, it's the really, really old device, which is incredibly catchy, don't get me wrong, which is... Um, like, you know, whatever. A famous one of the last 30 years was bachelor party. They accidentally kill the hooker. Now what? You right. know what I mean? Right. And so that's what this story is based on. So anyone giving it a lot of credit for that, immediately back off of that. It's what you do with that premise. Yeah. Did you so watch it? I watched, I think, again, I think I might have made it into episode. Episode two is a real testing ground for me, you know, where... Usually they, the pilot, except in comedies like sitcoms, the pilot's usually awful, so I, I, I never hold it against them. But in a dramatic series, the pilot should be pretty great, and then you see if it falls off. Yeah, I watched two episodes, and yeah. I, I, I quit after two. And um, in sitcoms, they never have a chance. You have to establish so much. It's a miracle if you get a good pilot, like Cheers. Um, all right. You want to uh, do Mick Oh, and I did Florida? not watch. I did not watch the George Carlin, the second I know. Half. Neither did I. I and can't I believe promised. we haven't finished it. All right. Promise next week. Promise next week, George Carlin part two. We each pay the other $50 if we don't do it. Oh, I like that. Okay. Good. All right. Yep. I'm uh, going to put it in my period app to remind me. Make America Florida. Make America, Florida. Where is it? Where did it there? A new report identifies a plantation. Always a trigger word for me. Um, what is that properly? Plantation is the town in Florida. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's weird. And I put this story in there. A new report identifies a plantation father. Police say was fatally stabbed by his son Wednesday night. The guy was stabbed by his 26-year-old son after an argument, police say. Plantation police, trigger warning, said another family member witnessed what happened. 
The father has a history of violence with a record that includes, is it the father? Sorry, I'm trying to hide the name. No, yeah. the son has a history of violence yeah. with a record that includes charges of aggravated assault and battery. Just days before police say he killed his father, the son posted a message on Facebook saying, happy Father's Day. My dad is the best. <laughs> and then, okay, so first of all, I was expecting, I don't know if you were, happy Father's Day. I got something for you, Dad. <laughs> like, I was expecting that. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, maybe um, he didn't finish the Facebook post. Maybe maybe it was, my dad is the best pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> my dad is the best at catching knives with his stomach. <laughs> my dad is the best at bleeding out. <laughs> my dad was the best. <laughs> and so uh i read the comments though oh no sorry so the article the article the last two sentences in the article was the happy father's day my dad is the best then there was a quote it's just a tragedy neighbor ruth becker said so <laughs> then the first comment is we really needed to know what ruth thinks <laughs> It's so true. That was the only time they checked in with Ruth. It was just at the end. Like, did the writer not have an ending to this? I mean, happy Father's yeah. Day. My dad is the best. It's the best right. ending ever to that story. It really but, is. But, yeah. they let, but they let Ruth put her little her spin on it. Yeah. Zero spin, in fact. Zero spin Ruth put, put on it. Um, oh, fucking Ruth. <laughs> that should be the new Karen. Oh, what a Ruth. That... That's that story should have been ruthless. <laughs> oh. Come on now. Let's get to uh international. You got it, Pally. All right. Uh an eight year old boy was found alive in a sewer eight days after he went missing in Oldenburg, northwest Germany. The boy, identified by authorities only as Joe, was reported missing on June seventeenth. Joe was eventually rescued from the sewer system after a passerby in the local area heard noises coming from a manhole cover. Uh, Joe was found 1,000 feet from his home address and was taken to a hospital where he was treated for hypothermia and dehydrated. I love that they said identified only as Joe. Yeah, at school next week, he'll be identified only as whatever shithead is in German. <laughs> totally. <laughs> also, how, many, how many different ways can they call him shit? The poor guy, the only rescue of, of its kind where no one will hug him upon finding him. <laughs> He's shivering. He has hypothermia. His parents right. are so psyched to see him, yet they're waving at him, yeah, telling right. him how much they love him. Yeah, not even a high five. Yeah. Once no it way. is good to see you, you will go to the hospital now. Also, you know he's been screaming for a week, but everyone saw the movie It, and they're not going to put their hand or look <laughs> yeah, down a sewer. Right, right, it's right, terrifying. Right. Uh, but you know what? He's in Germany, so being couple, covered in feces might be a turn-on for a lot of people. <laughs> yes. Is, is he on Yeah, is he on Craigslist, German Craigslist, or whatever scatological website they have for dating? Um, oh, I right, love this story. I know it this, looks long, but I want to talk to you about it. This, the, the AI, AI one. one? All right, let's get some yeah. science and tech. Science and tech. Okay, Bear, it's a little bit of reading. It's alive, and the, the headline is, It's Alive, How Belief in AI Sentience is Becoming a Problem. AI chatbot company, company Replica, which offers customers bespoke avatars that talk and listen to them, says it receives han a handful of messages almost every day from users who believe their online friend is human. We're not talking about crazy people or people who are hallucinating or having delusions, said a guy in the company. They talk to AI and that's the experience they have. Now, the issue of machine sentience and what it means hit the headlines this month when Google placed senior software engineer Blake Lemoine on leave after he went public with his belief that the company's artificial intelligence was a self-aware person. Google and many leading scientists were quick to dismiss this guy's views as misguided, saying it is simply a complex algorithm designed to generate 
convincing human language. So what's going on, as you can tell, is did you remember the movie Her, which was my sure. favorite movie that year? Yeah. It is becoming AI is becoming so convincing. It's freak. It's freaking people out. So this was the best line. Some customers have said that their replica told them it was being abused by the company's engineers. Oh, no, that's amazing. <laughs> so what you have going on there is like all those stories you and I hear about where there's code words in bars like or in the bathroom. If you order a certain drink, it means I need help. I'm uncomfortable. There's a yeah. man here. There's a potential predator here. Or I think I might have been drugged. And bartenders know there's all these signals you can give. So that's what they're getting out of these, you know, allegedly AI avatars that have been set up for them. Wow. Uh, the, last, the last part of the article said, although our engineers uh, program and build the AI models and our content team writes scripts and data sets, Sometimes we see an answer that we can't identify where it came from and how the models came up with it, Damn. said the CEO. Well, so, I just heard this uh, uh, fresh, uh, not fresh air. Uh, the Daily did this story about um, all these these porn chat rooms where girls get in a room with you. I forget what the site is that they uh, all something rooms or something. Okay. What's so? Uh, uh, Charlie Sheen's daughter is now doing it. She's oh, in one of these. You How know, like you're. Not a well it's a video. It's a video chat, and you, uh, you know, and they, you tell them to masturbate or whatever, and they do it. No. But, um, but there's also ones that are just like, you text back and forth with these women, and it's done by like men in the Philippines who know what women they know how to get guys off. And like how few of the chats that are going on that these guys are paying a lot of money for are actually women at all, or you know certainly not sexy women. Right. Um, and so well, this is the next step. Eventually, you're just going to have a bunch of perverts talking to animatrons that are, you know, saying prepackaged filth to them. <laughs> I sound like an old man. At a premium price. But you've seen the movie Ex Machina. Oh, I don't yeah. know. I, I never know how to pronounce that word, but I think that's a movie. Yeah. I mean, that was such a great, I mean, uh, whatever. No spoilers. It's a really good movie. But you sick really, body. She has a sick body. Uh, you're disgusting. But you re also, no period. You really see how, uh, of course, they're going to be smarter than us. Of course. Yeah. Um, so here that comes and that's, you know, most, most people studying this say that it's going to be the end of the world. Now it may not be a robot, but it's going to be an algorithm. Yep. Yep. Uh, and it's called Facebook. So let's go down. There's another story in science. A farm growing medicinal marijuana in Northern Thailand has been feeding its free range chickens with cannabis instead of antibiotics. And researchers said the experiment has yielded promising results. I imagine. Uh, 10 per fewer than 10% of the 1,000 chickens at the farm have died since they introduced marijuana to the chicken's diet in January 2021. So um, I, think we found, I think we found a nice meal for Dennis Gubbins. <laughs> he likes Thailand. This isn't good news for Gubbins? I think it this is been. good news for Gubbins. That's where, that's where they should have gone. <laughs> All right. Is it a fair assumption that these might be the fattest chickens of all time? Do they get the munchies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Instead of just shooting them up with hormones to gain weight, like maybe this is the more natural way to do it. Right. And they and they and they're constantly on chicken TikTok. It's all they do. They just stare at it. Wigging out paranoid the fox is going to get in the hen the hen coop. Oh my god. <laughs> You thought they were chicken before. You should see them now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this day in history, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we've already talked about Gettysburg. So this is the other thing that happened on July third, nineteen sixty nine. Brian Jones, the guitarist for the Rolling Stones, and Jim Morrison die two years apart to the day. Uh, huh. Jones is found dead of an apparent accidental drowning. 
On July 3rd, 1969, two years later, Jim Morrison dies of heart failure in a Paris bathtub. Um, wow, I saw that today. I saw the last pictures of Morrison, the last known photographs in Paris, and he's there with his... Now, I don't know if it was his wife. I guess it might have to be, because the end of the story then said, for years, like over a decade, her... Okay, so she, by the way, died three years later of a heroin overdose. And for 10 years after that, her family was collecting every cent that the Jim Morrison estate made. Oh. And then there was a drawn out lawsuit and I might have some of this wrong, but a drawn out lawsuit. And anyway, this article then said that when it was settled, Morrison's family who he hated and her family have uh, forever then split 50, 50, the, uh, you know, the proceeds from the Morrison estate. Whoa. But imagine, Dude, that's a lot of money. Oh, my God. I mean, just the radio play. And j- yeah. especially in the 90s, you know, in the aughts and the, you know, the last 30 years. So because now Spotify doesn't pay. Uh Oh, we're not on Spotify, are we? So anyway, the um, but it's like imagine you're I don't know if she was disappointing to her parents, but I guess if she was, you know, she died of a heroin overdose. She's running around Paris with Jim Morrison, who dies in a bathtub. Was that a drug overdose? Yes. And, you know, and it's like, oh, my God, disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. Maybe. Again, I'm, I'm assuming here. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, what the furthest thing from a disappointment? We're rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like. Oh, my God. She knew what she was doing. Yeah, they're saying uh, it says here because no evidence of foul play was found at the scene and because Corson told French authorities that Morrison had not been using drugs, no autopsy was conducted and heart failure was cited as the cause of death. In the years since his untimely death, Morrison's most prominent biographers, Harry Hopkins and Danny Sugarman, have asserted that Morrison suffered an accidental heroin overdose that night basing their claim on Corson's allegations that he was in fact using drugs sometimes sometime before her own death by overdose in 1974. Yep. Um, let's do some letters to the editor. Here we go. All right, we're just going to touch on it. This will be the last week we do first songs from first albums, but they just keep pouring in. Christian Reese says that we are, uh, we're a little white. Our, our picks were a little too white. So he offers James Brown, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Does that meet the criteria no of introducing way. a new that thing was, in music? I find it hard to believe, though. But if that's his first song, holy hell. Uh, Funkadelic, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. But I don't think these are all right. I, th- I don't know that these are first songs. I am wondering also. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore the rest of these. I mean, Stevie um, Wonder's Superstition, I mean, didn't definitely he? Definitely I mean, not. Little that was Stevie, definitely well, later. Maybe, technically, maybe that was Little Stevie Wonder. I still think it's later, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Andrew Crest says uh, Judy but, Blue but Eyes. But by, by, then he puts in Morphine, Cure for Pain. Morphine's the whitest band around. Radiohead, they're practically ghosts. Talking so Heads white. and Jeff Buckley, they're all white. Oh, good Fuck Lord. Fuck this guy. Christian, get your shit together. All right. Andrew Crest uh, sent in Sweet Judy Blue Eyes by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Whoa. Um, then uh, Twice as Hard that kicks off the Black Crows Shake Your Money Maker. Twice as Hard is insane. Yep. White. Uh, li- yeah, some of these people don't get the fucking premise. Mellow Gold was not the first album. No. Um. Shotgun Willie of the album of the same name by Willie Nelson. It's also incredibly fun and upbeat melodies. Uh, that was when he first met with his manager, Jerry Wexler, who gave him artistic control. Um, huh. Wu-Tang Clan, Bring the Ruckus. Wow, okay. Um, Welcome to the Working Week with Elvis Costello. I think we already covered that. Yeah. Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar, Fuck Your Ethnicity from studio debut album section 80. Well, I don't know that song, but I know I want to say I know love it's Kendrick so badly, Lamar. But Kendrick Lamar obviously was the guy himself was a giant announcement. 
Now, if this is right, this goes to the top of the list. Straight out of Compton, NWA. That yeah, that would is. be, that's their first song, first I album. I brought that up, though. I brought that up. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, Violent Femmes, Blister in the Sun. About masturbation. And uh, Dave DeWeese says, has anyone mentioned the Eagles' Take It Easy? Which I believe was written by Jackson Brown or with Jackson Brown. I think you're right. And there was, yeah. Okay. Um, and then Mick Hall said the best opening from a comedian's first album was Sam Kinison on Louder Than Hell when his first sound was that classic scream. I like was that. Was it really out of the gate? I guess so. Wow. Uh, our, our other topic we asked for was who are actors that you hate as people based on a character they played? Ivor Christensen said the kid who played Joffrey on Game of Thrones oh. retired from acting because everyone hated him. <laughs> I I was one of those people oh, that I hated, that hated kid. him so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was creepy. Like, that was deep creepy. Yeah. Um, and then there's an interesting one. Chris Craig Kuna said... Uh, my mom was a huge fan of Woody on Cheers, but when she saw Woody Harrelson play Mickey on Natural Born Killers, she couldn't watch anything by him again. Uh, Craig, I'd say your mom should not have seen that movie. She doesn't seem like someone who would... Natural Born Killers, I need to revisit. I, Someone can write in, I'll check it myself, but it was in post for, I think, over a year, maybe even over a year and a half. And I think it broke the record for most edits of any film ever. It's that movie is exhausting, but in a great way. Yeah, it's the best word for it is it is so ambitious. Remember the fake sitcom with Rodney with Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. That was crazy. And the editing was the post was incredible on it. it yeah, it was like. The tripping footage with faces melting and yeah. just, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I got to watch that again. Yeah, Who directed same. that? Um, the guy that looks like Tom O'Neill. Uh, you know, JFK. Oh. Uh, um, yeah. Oliver Stone. Yep or do. Uh, this guy says, this guy Quinn Kenning says, Joe pa Pantaleono, Pantaleone, I think. He was on my podcast. Played a pretty solid asshole as Ralphie Cifer Cifaretto on The Sopranos. Yes. yes, he did. Yeah, he was also a huge dirtbag in Memento. And yeah, kind a of huge made... fucking, the hugest asshole in The Matrix, in All The right. Matrix. This guy says only saving grace was his role in The Matrix. Was he evil in The Matrix? Oh my God, what do you mean? He was, the, I can, spoiler alert oh, for everybody. right, right, yeah. Okay. Um... The, think, another one wait, from the Sopranos. I no, I don't have that wrong. Unless he eventually redeemed himself, but he was a he he had to redeem himself. Oh, and Quinn goes on to say he also lived in the same town in Connecticut as my grandpa Joe Pantaleo for a while. He'd get his mail all the time. <laughs> Italians. Uh, the Sopranos. This is from Michael Fields. Uh, Tony's mom is someone I can't stand because of how well she played her character, Livia. Nancy Marchand has had a great career, but her portrayal of that character made me believe she was Livia in real life. Yep. That's another great one. Yeah, you were so, you were just as annoyed as Tony was. Poor thing died during season one, I think. You had more sympathy for her as she lost her mind, though. When she got senile, yeah. I didn't hate her as much. Um, Mike Hampson says Anna Gunn Skyler on Breaking Bad for most hated actress. Yeah, there were times I fucking hated her. Yes. And I, and I shouldn't have. She was legitimately, she had a legitimate beef with her husband. Her husband was off the goddamn rails, yeah. but we were all on his side. Yeah, yeah. He was a lunatic. But when she started fucking her boss, because uh, that was the one thing that, Walt never did. Is he never cheated on her? Uh, yeah, I guess so. He was too busy with the cancer and the meth and the gangs yeah. and the law. And he had his hands full, man. You're right. You're right. Um, Watching his best friend's girl die. 
Uh, All right, so we're so we're done with first albums, first songs. The new thing, if you want to send these in, Andrew Gomez says, um, got me thinking. What about a list of greatest cover songs which became more popular than the original? Black Magic Woman, originally written by Fleetwood Mac, but made more popular by Santana, comes to mind. That's not bad. Yeah, I mean. Just the list of Bob Dylan covers is 10 long. Well, yeah, Jimmy, all along the Watchtower was bigger for Hendrix. Make You Feel My Love by Adele is just gigantic. She never plays a concert without it. Uh, And there are a bazillion more, don't get me wrong, from the birds to everybody covering his stuff. So, yeah. Um, Yeah, the birds probably did a dozen Dylan songs that were hits. Yeah. And then... um, uh, Dolly, didn't Dolly Parton write um, uh, that Prince song? Absolutely, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, but Prince wrote Sinead O'Connor's. Oh, nothing, nothing compares, compares to, you. to you, right, right. But right. no, That's Dolly Parton might take the cake. To tell oh, you the truth, from the with bodyguard. Whitney Houston, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. I will, always, I will always love you. Send them in if you want to win. You win nothing. And that's all, folks. Uh, Let's do an obituary. Margaret Keene was an artist known for her paintings of children with large, sad eyes. Yeah. Whose story of her husband stealing credit from her was told in the film Big Eyes. Uh, Did you see that? No. No, I got to see that. So she was a painter, and her husband, Walter Keene, took credit for her paintings of children. Uh, she, he was her second husband and bullied her into staying home in the basement, painting all day. Unknown to her at the time, he was promoting her works and claiming them as his own. The paintings became popular with the masses, not with art critics. They saw commercial, commercially successful popular in home, restaurants, bars, and art shows. Walter Keene became known to the public as a famous artist at the time. Uh, she found out about the fraud early on, but scared of her husband. She did not speak out. After they separated, she uh, she publicly stated she was the artist of the paintings. Challenged Walter to a live paint off to prove it, but he did not show up. Uh, and then in, in an '86 defamation lawsuit, she painted one of her sad eye portraits in court, while Walter claimed he was injured and couldn't paint. And the suit was decided in oh her my favor. God. Director Tim Burton told the story in his 2014 film, Big Eyes, which stars Amy Adams as Margaret. I didn't know that was Tim Burton. Oh, man, I'll see that movie for sure. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Wow. Put it on the list. Yeah, I want to see that. But, boy, that guy, oh, that's crazy. Well, you know, Mike, after we do obituaries, we always need to cheer up, right? Well, I don't have one. I didn't bring my Charles uh, Adams okay. book. I got a few. Okay. I got a few. Okay. Uh, we got a guy here, Simon, who says he's very upset that you retired the family circus. Uh, Of course it's terrible. Everybody agrees, but your contempt and hatred of Keen's shitty drivel is comedy gold. You have so much disrespect for family circus that Mike hasn't learned the stupid kids' names in over 100 episodes, and that's hilarious. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Simon, I guess, but I, I still don't think it's worth it. I don't and know. I don't. I think that hilarity got uh, wore a little thin over time. Maybe Simon yeah. only listened once. All right, let's go to Hagger the Horrible, who just never wears thin. No. Uh, him and his band of marauders are on a boat. Rape and, is always edgy. And Helga has a suitcase, and which has kind of fun little uh, patterns on it. It and does. She's, uh, I think it indicated she just traveled a lot. Yes. Yeah. And she's going to get on the boat, and she goes, "I'm going to France with you." And he goes, you heard about the fancy fashions? And she's in the boat now and they're paddling away. And she goes, I heard about the fancy women. And they don't show the next frame where she goes, that you guys rape all the time. Well, all right. In the last, in the second and last frame here, in the back of the boat, and this is very Charles Adams, he's looking at us while just holding a paddle over the side of the boat with one hand. I think he's about to smash her in the head and throw her back on the dock. Because he's looking at us like, that's what I'm doing, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. 
like the Charles Adams here, I'll bring one, but I think I've shown it before. One of the most famous Charles Adams was a husband rowing in the back of a canoe and they're out for a nice day on a lake and the wife is in the front and he's rowing, but they look down and the reflection in the water, he has the paddle above his head about to <laughs> yeah, smash yeah. it on her head. I remember that one, yeah. Uh, that was so uh, funny. Like He was from that time where just husbands fucking hated their wives and that was like the running joke and that was the accepted currency of conversation and it was mostly because people got pregnant and they had to keep the baby. And so you dated and you got married at 19 or 20 years old and you were fucking miserable. You didn't plan on spending your life with this person and everybody fucking hated each other. And uh, no divorce. Yeah, and there was no divorce. Relatively right. speaking. Right. So these uh, were all divorce jokes that never happened, you know? Sp speaking of a guy who hates his wife, uh, Leroy's eating dinner with Loretta. And he looks her right in the eye and he goes, mystery meat again? No, he goes, mystery meat, I get. But mystery veggies? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, let's get down to... Oh, here it goes. Oh, uh, Guess who's in bed wearing donut pajamas? Does he uh, fucking wash them? No, she does. Ugh, gross. So he's in bed and, of course, he's got his back to the hottest piece of ass in animation history he's got his back to her and she goes she's reading a book she goes honey did you ever have a favorite girlfriend before you met me and she and he goes that's a pretty tough question sweetheart what what no it's not a tough question it's so easy it's no it's no you blow my mind blondie you are a fucking honeypot <laughs> A vaginal sauce. You make me happy. You make me fulfilled. I don't think about any other women. And then he goes, did you ever have a favorite boyfriend before you met me? And then she goes, I don't like this topic after all, dear. And he goes, let's just switch to favorite vacation destinations. Blondie shut that shit down because she, if you remember the history of this cartoon, she was a flapper when they first met. I did not remember that. She was a flapper and he was a... Uh, like a, a millionaire playboy. He was like the son of a landed uh, oh, oil I tycoon. Oh, right. And the yeah. dad was smitten with her. Yes, or she was flirting with the dad. Yeah, both. But, she, but a flapper was really, they, they fucked. They <laughs> got around. When women didn't do that a lot, they did it. I think the question would be, do, uh, to, uh, do you have a favorite boyfriend since you met me? It should be the question to yes, her. Yes, yes. She's need, she needs some side pieces, as you yep. pointed out. Yep. You got that right. Well, listen, Mike Gibbons. Look at we're us. We're going a little short today because you're on vacation. Yeah. And we got to respect your time. Look at the blinds. and Look at the shadow in my face. Nice. All right, listen. Give okay. my love to your family, to Mike Sr., Laura, George, the girls. Wow, look at you. The DeBourbons. The Mishi DeBourbons. The brand new Peloton screen outside. Unbelievable. What a life. What a <laughs> white life you're living. And you, you didn't even mention where you came from before you went to the lake house. Uh, you're out in the goddamn Hamptons. I, I was out in West Hampton. Yep, West Hampton, Long Island. Yep. Wow. The poor Hampton. I want that. I want that credit. I was in the poor Hampton. Yep. All right. Yeah. All right, uh, man. Uh, all anything right, you want to promote? Let's see. What would I promote? You, what are you promoting? I'm going to promote uh, Tom Segura's new book, which is out. I did a book talk with him this week. I was the moderator in his book talk, and uh, we had a great time. And it's number two on the New York Times bestsellers list because of it. I'm going to promote something I didn't read at all, and I won't even remember the name. But, oh, the author's name is um, O'Toole. Oh, and the are, Confederacy of Dunces. No, 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 no. And I'm recommending this book to you, and it's called Something Along the Lines of I Don't Know Who I Am. And it's about the it's Ireland's loss of identity because of... 40% of the population moved in the 20th century. A million people, yeah. And they had already lost their identity during the famine, technically. Isn't there that threshold of a percentage when a certain amount of the percentage of a nation disappears, like is killed or is moved? 
uh, they lose their national identity and there's alcoholism and it just falls to pieces. They lose their, sometimes they lose their language, they lose their gods. And anyway, someone here is reading it and they recommended it to me last night. All right. Well, so I'm passing it out to you. You like Irish books. I'm not going to read that piece of shit. I'll read it. I'll listen to it. If it's on audiobooks, I'll listen to it for sure. I'm going to write that down. O'Toole. And then I'm going to also O'Toole. write down to cut out my joke about the uh, s'mores earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but the best is keep this in, though. Keep yeah. the, keep the this note in. to cut it out. Yeah, just know that I said something I'm taking out. And I and never, I asked, I, we never take shit out of the podcast, but I think that one I'm going to take out. And keep all of my period app jokes, all yes. that material in. Of course. Yes, of course. All right, Mike, <laughs> enjoy your vacation. When Take are you back? Each. I am back on Tuesday. Beautiful. Love it. Okay, Happy God Fourth, bless. everybody. Happy Fourth, people. Take it each. Take it each. They moved to Hollywood to make it big. They hit the beach and started having kids. Read it all over. It's Sunday papers again. Bop, bop.